Welcome to the 2022 Digital Transformation Summit. Please welcome the CEO of the Maryland Tech Council, Marty Rosendale. Good morning. Good morning. I, I love the enthusiasm. It's great, it's great to be back together again in person. And the venue is fantastic, right? So good morning, everybody. I'm Marty Rosendale. I'm the CEO of the Maryland Tech Council. Welcome to the third annual Digital Transformation Summit. The first two Digital Transformation Summits were entirely virtual due to the pandemic. So this is the first time that we've been able to come together in person. So I really appreciate being able to see you all. Um, you know, this, this still is the tail end of the pandemic, so of course masks are acceptable, handshakes, hugs, fist bumps, whatever you're comfortable with. <clears throat> now we also have a virtual audience, so I want to welcome everybody who's joining us over, the, over their computer, over the live stream. And I want to ask all of you, if you have questions today, please step up to the mic. That way, everybody who's watching virtually will be able to hear the question that you ask. And the, and the mic is right here in the center of the room. So over the past two years, we've all experienced a massive acceleration in digital transformation. But digital transformation transcends the pandemic. It's the central question guiding how organizations and their stakeholders interact in the future. Nearly two-thirds of companies surveyed by McKinsey and Company in 2021 said they must build digital businesses just to remain viable. So how many of you plan to join Todd Marks and MindGrub in the metaverse? <laughs> <clears throat> and will customers from different backgrounds and interests get equal value from your digital experience? Today's Digital Transformation Summit will explore these pressing questions. <clears throat> questions including the future of 5G in Maryland, digital twins in healthcare, and some pretty cool emerging technology. But first this morning, I'd like to thank our sponsors who, without their help, this wouldn't be possible. Our title sponsor today is GuideHouse. Our gold sponsors include AT&T, Children's National Hospital, Crown Castle, Fearless, Invest Hong Kong, Iron Bow Technologies, the Maryland Department of Commerce, and MindGrub. And I want to give a special thanks to Wendy Worm on our staff for putting this together. I, you know, most, most of you have probably experienced um, some difficulties recruiting and retaining staff lately. We haven't, we haven't been immune from that. Wendy's had been, been short-staffed now for quite some time, but still managed to put together quite an event this morning. So let, let's take a minute and talk about some of the exciting things happening at the MTC. So under the direction of Latoya Staten with Fearless and a director at MTC, Latoya, put your hand up so people can see you. The Maryland Tech Council launched its Technology Inclusivity Initiative. The Inclusivity Initiative is to advance inclusivity within the state's technology industry and fuel socioeconomic advancement throughout Maryland. And we'll hear from David Tone, the chair of Maryland Technology, in just a few minutes. I think he's going to say a few more words about the TI2 initiative. Now, MTC has also recently launched two new chapters. Now, I know uh, Bernard Wright, with, uh, founder and CEO of Wave, welcome. Bernard, it's hard, it's hard for me to see past the stage lights, but there he is. So Bernard is the chairman of the Prince George's County Tech Council, um, who held a very successful launch event just a couple of weeks ago. And then we have a second chapter initiative with the Baltimore Regional Tech Council that will be holding their launch event um, coming up in the next few weeks. I'm also very excited to announce that recently we received a $2.45 million in funding in the congressionally directed spending from Senator Van Hollen to support the Maryland Biohub. And yesterday we learned that our Governor Hogan has also proposed another two and a half million dollars to support the, the launch and the development of the Biohub. So 
So a couple of events that you ought to mark in your calendar. On April 7th, the Business Continuity Task Force Executive Insight Series, we have a, an episode on digital communication strategy with Andrew Woods from DuckPin. On April 13th, we we're going to, going to be holding a TI2 inclusivity event on how to win the economic competitiveness battle, where I'll have an opportunity to sit down and talk with Jonathan Hollyfield. On May 12th, we're excited to produce our annual industry award celebration, and it's truly going to be a celebration this year. It will be in person, heavy hors d'oeuvres, open bar, live band, and of course, a lot of amazing awards. On May 16th, we have our annual golf tournament, weather permitting, at Bethesda Country Club. On May 24th, the MTC Executive Series on Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning. And then save the date for our annual Bioinnovation Conference, October 3rd and 4th of this year, also at the Bethesda Country Club. So just a few housekeeping notes. If you're, if you're tweeting about the event today, use hashtag MTC Digi Summit 2022. I'll spell that out for you. That's hashtag MTC D I G I S U M M I T 2022. Make sure to visit all of our exhibitors out in the foyer. They helped make this possible today. And if you're not an MTC member, please find one of our staff and talk to them about membership. So thank you all for your continued support. Those of you that are here, those of you that are joining us virtually. I hope you have a great event, and at this time, although David Tone couldn't join us in person, I, I know he's been able to join us virtually, so I'm gonna turn it over to David Tone, the chairman of Maryland Technology. Thank you all. Thank you, Marty, and welcome to today's third annual Digital Transformation Summit. I'm David Tone, the chair of the Maryland Technology Board and CEO of BTS Software Solutions. I apologize for greeting you virtually, I was looking forward to today's sessions with thought leaders and change agents as we think about what digital transformation looks like for our society, our economy, and for the common person. COVID clearly had other ideas. But in making the decision to greet you virtually, it occurred to me that this, right now, is also part of digital transformation that we are talking about. Transformation takes more than just the transformative technology. It takes adoption and integration into the every person's life. Just as it is not noteworthy that we flip a light switch instead of lighting a candle, drive a car instead of saddling a horse, creating a Word document instead of using a typewriter, transformation is ultimately a social event, a human event. We have truly transformed when change becomes the norm, when the changes wrought are ordinary and unremarkable. Me being here on Zoom is equally unremarkable. When our economy, our education system, and our workforce have absorbed the change, when how we view wealth and progress has taken these changes on board and we look to move to the next change, the next transformation, we know we are on the right path. Maryland Technology, a division of the Maryland Technology Council, the MTC, provides a forum designed to further economic development in our community through, through the support of innovation and commercialization of advanced technologies. Our first Digital Transformation Summit in September of 2020 took place in a virtual platform with 150 attendees and 10 speakers. In March 2021, our second summit was produced virtually over two days and had 219 attendees and 22 speakers. Today, we have close to 175 registrants. We have a full day of sessions, networking, that will end with a cocktail reception this evening, which sadly, I'll be missing. I would like to thank our program committee members who helped organize the speakers and sessions. Please raise your hands. Thank you for your support and your hard work. As Marty mentioned, we have launched the Technology Inclusion Initiative, TI2. TI2 is a statewide initiative that will capitalize on the strength of MTC as a statewide organization with almost 500 members and countless local and national leaders and partners in the technology industry to identify, facilitate, and enable solutions that advance diversity, equity, and inclusivity within technology organizations and the technology industry in Maryland, to identify, facilitate, and enable technology-based solutions that enable socioeconomic advancement and empowerment of underrepresented groups who have significant potential, and to lay the groundwork for other states on how to develop and successfully implement an inclusion program. Please do join us on April 13th to hear a fireside chat with Marty and Jonathan Hollifeld, attorney, civil rights advocate, tech-based economic development executive, and former NFL athlete on how to win the economic competitiveness battle. 
Please stay for networking and cocktails after. We have a great lineup of speakers who are experts in the industries, from our keynote speakers to those leading speaking sessions today. I would like to welcome Dr. Anthony Cristillo, partner, guidehouse, and title sponsor for today's event. Dr. Cristillo, thank you for your time. Good morning. Um, my name is Dr. Tony Cristillo. I'm a partner at GuideHouse. Um, we are a leading global provider of global management, consulting services, and technology solutions. We support clients in the areas of health, uh, defense, national security, financial services, uh, managed services, energy sustainability, and infrastructure. We have over 12,000 employees in 50 locations globally, helping to solve our clients' most challenging, complex problems. We are a proud sponsor of this event today. The Digital Transformation Summit truly brings together thought leaders from various industries and around the region to talk about and discuss trends, technological trends that are being impactful today and will continue to do so into the future. And we are pleased to be part of convening um, these discussions. Um, with that, I am truly thrilled to introduce today's keynote speaker, Mike Gill, Secretary, Department of Commerce. Mike is an entrepreneur and business leader who was twice tapped by Governor Larry Hogan of Maryland to lead the state's economic development efforts and help transform its business climate. He began his career as a rookie sales rep at IBM in 1974. He later served in professional services firm Ernst & Young before establishing himself as an entrepreneur. He founded Americom, a technical services company serving the wireless industry in 1984. And when he sold it in 2000, it had grown to over 1,200 team members. In 2007, Mike joined Evergreen Advisors, a middle market investment bank firm that has raised over $5 billion in value for publicly traded and privately held companies. He left Evergreen in 2014 to join the Hogan administration as Maryland's first ever Secretary of Commerce. Under the leadership of Governor Hogan, Mike and Team Commerce helped transform Maryland's business climate, creating what he calls the culture of yes. After four years of public service, he returned to the private sector as chairman and principal of Evergreen Advisors, only to be asked again by Governor Hogan in late 2021 to lead commerce once more for the final year of his administration. A passionate supporter of higher education, Mike has also served on the Board of Regents at the University Systems of Maryland, the Board of Visitors of Towson's University, and the, public, and the President's Advisory Board at Clemson University. He was awarded an honorary degree from Towson, his alma mater, in 1996. He and his wife, Mary, have been married for 47 years with three grown children, eight grandchildren. Please join me in welcoming Mike Gill. Are we live? Are we live? Okay. I've already lost 30 seconds. I'm going to pay attention. Uh, good morning to everyone. This, uh, this is fun. Um, first of all, Marty, uh, where'd Marty go and sit? Marty, thank you for your great leadership of MTC. Fantastic. And, uh, and even though David couldn't be with us, David's been a great leader. And Tony, thank you for the kind introduction to be one of the major sponsors. And let me just say uh, real quickly to some of the Team Commerce folks, uh, Kimberly Menzel, who's our cyber person, Kyle McCaugan, my chief of staff, great, great young man, love Kyle. Um, where's Mel? Mel Corey. There's Mel. Lori Ratzberg. Where's Lori? Lori. Fantastic. Look, anything you need, just ask them. I'm just, <laughs> it's clearly that I'm just a pretty face in this deal. So whatever you need. And Commerce, we're awful proud to be a sponsor. <sighs> Real quickly, because I got a lot on my mind, and I'm so glad to be here. I'm glad you're all here. 
aren't you sick and tired of the way we've been living? <laughs> hey, and by the way, how perfect to have it here at Laurel. My, but, <laughs> my, my, my buddy, Neil Gate, we were talking, and I thought to myself, you know, uh, people, if you're anywhere close to the horse industry, you know the fact that Maryland's a big deal relative to thoroughbred industry. It's a big deal. More horses per capita in Maryland than in Kentucky. No other state in the nation. That's a big deal. And that concludes my remarks. <laughs> I want to leave you with something. <clears throat> so second chapter, real quickly, how I got back here. And I, was, I did think I was going to spend my winter down where it was a little bit warmer, where I could work on my short game. I got a text from the Gov early January, and he said, uh, hey, your successor is resigning because she needs to spend her time running for her next opportunity. And he goes, look, Michael Jordan went back to the Bulls. They won a couple more championships. He said, so come on back. It'll be our last dance. And I thought, son of a gun. There goes my short game for another season. My wife said yes. She said, you ought to do it, honey. You loved it the first time around. She paused for a second. She said, now you get a paycheck, don't you? I said, oh, yeah. I get a paycheck, too. Let's go fast. How we ended up here today, how I ended up here, what's happened the last seven plus years in the state of Maryland. Larry Hogan ran on the theme of Change Maryland. You know, he kept, he was, he's a lifelong Marylander. He kept watching what was happening. He saw Maryland going over the proverbial cliff in the direction that it was heading. And he said, you know, we got to step up, we got to do something about it. The Augustine Commission, Norm Augustine, he headed it up. The Augustine Commission was put together by the late Mike Miller and Mike Bush. I like both of those guys a lot. They asked Norm Augustine to take 24 people and to try to identify whether Maryland was going in the wrong direction. Norm Augustine, that, meant, that a number of you know, Norm writes, this is great. Norm writes, and I just wanted to, to quote it the way he wrote it. This is the cover letter to Miller and Bush in January of 2015 to answer the question whether Maryland was going in the wrong direction from an economic development standpoint. And in the first paragraph of his cover letter, he wrote, there's a, it's widely perceived that Maryland has an anti-business attitude, the number one impediment to economic prosperity, the attitude towards businesses. Are you kidding me? That ought to be the low-hanging fruit that is being supportive and positive to business. But that was really the first thing Norm wrote. And on top of that, he said, we're living off of federal government jobs. It's almost as if we didn't know that we had life sciences. We didn't know we had brilliant technologists. We didn't know we had something called the Port of Baltimore. We didn't know we had something called Patuxent with 30,000 people in the Navy, Navy airspace, NSA, and all those other cool things, the things in manufacturing. We were just trying to make do with federal government jobs. And when that got turned down a little bit, all of a sudden the world changed. I didn't see this coming the first time around. I saw it even coming less the second time around. Governor Hogan was supposed to lose. The week before the election, he was supposed to lose by 19 points. That's what the Washington Post said. I mean, he's up against a pretty attractive candidate. Looked like he had all the things that you would need to win in Maryland. Larry Hogan wins by five points. And we're off and running. And I got a phone call from Jim Brady, the late Jim Brady. Love Jim Brady. He said, Mike, you ever thought about being Secretary of Commerce? And that was the first time I said, not on my radar screen. But it was only two or three weeks later, I was meeting with Governor Hogan in Annapolis. And he said, hey, look, Mike, I got 20 cabinet secretaries. I want to get them all right. He goes, I want no mulligans. But I really got to get the one right that I want you to take, because we ran on Change Maryland. We can't keep going in this direction. During the previous administration, 43 consecutive tax hikes. I, I'm just, I was trying to wrap my head around 43 consecutive tax hikes. And by the way, with the governor's announcement, and he was able to literally get Adrian Jones and Bill Ferguson to kumbaya with his desire to reduce retirement taxes for many Marylanders. And I did the math in my head. And I went to Calvert Hall, so I can't really do real complex math. <laughs> Any Calvert Hall folks in the room? There's always at least one. There we go. There we go, Greg. We were talking about that. Um, 43 consecutive tax hikes, which, by the way, represented about $3.5 billion that we yanked out of your pocket and your pocket and your pocket. Governor Hogan, year to date, is up to about, including this one, he's up to pushing $5 billion plus in tax cuts now into the eighth year of his administration. 
I'm, do, I'm thinking in my head. So we're down three, we're up five. Look at that swing from what we're talking about. And we've always known that the key to having a great economy is to have very, very fair taxes, great attitude, and what we have going for us that nobody has like we do are the great assets. Are you kidding me? I came into this position seven years ago, and now I'm a Baltimore kid. I've, I've never really left the area for that very long. I had no idea how great our assets were. And I thought to myself, it's kind of like folks who buy that old house and they're stripping all, it's 125 years old and there's four layers of paint and there's five layers of wallpaper and there's wood paneling that, that is, uh, looks like it's uh, in somebody's basement because we all remember one of those kind of wood panel basements. And they started stripping it down and they went, oh my God, have you seen that port of Baltimore that's back behind that painting, seventh most efficient port in the uh, United States? Oh my gosh. There's 32,000 people down at Fort Meade's not a place where military guys are. There's 32,000 people that work in cyber. Are you kidding me? Life sciences? You go up 270, it's all those, all those buildings with X's on the end of the last names. It's, 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 just up, it's just up and down there. And of course, the best thing that ever happened to Frederick was Montgomery County. And they're, and they're rocking and rolling. So it keeps getting better and better and better. So the governor has made a difference with taxes. The regulatory side, he took a knife out early on in the administration. We got 10,000 regulations in this, in this uh, state. Is there anybody that needs 10,000 regulations? The gov has been able to figure out how to have about, do a little abracadabra and make about 1,500 plus of them go away. So we got taxes going to a better place, regulatory environment, a little bit better place. But I knew from the beginning when we all came together Brett Shriver and Steve Penny, we were all together back then, and LaToya was there at the same time. I knew that the real key that we could do something about was what I called the third, the third leg, taxes, regulations, and an A for attitude. And a buddy of mine used to say, it costs nothing to be nice. Are you kidding me? You know, we created a commerce cabinet. I gave out a goodie bag to all the secretaries at that first commerce cabinet meeting. I gave them a magic wand, because I said, sometimes you're gonna have to have a little magic I gave him a magic eight ball because I said a lot of times, you know, the first decision isn't going to work, so shake it again. Gave him my favorite book of all times, The Little Engine That Could. If that's not the greatest book, I'll put that up against any book. Positive, upbeat, never, never quit. Pictures, big print, not that long. If that's not your kind of book, I don't know what you read. The fourth book I gave him was a book called Be Our Guest about Disney. I gave it to six other cabinet secretaries. I said, who said the government's supposed to be a pain in the butt for all the businesses? Let's be like Disney. Let, what's Disney say? How can we help you? Disney said, we hope you have a pleasant stay. We're here to serve you. Guess what? We all bought into it, all the other cabinet secretaries. Because at the end of the day, economic development is always a team sport. It ain't about Mike Gill and a handful of commerce people that are dedicated to try to make a difference. It's not just Marty trying to fight it out, getting the bio hub done, things of that nature. It's not just a, a regional rep like, like uh, what Mel's doing with Baltimore City trying to make a difference, or Mita with Pam Ruff and what she's trying to do throughout the state. It's everybody together. That's how you move the needle. That's why Maryland went from being 49 out of 50 states for who would want to do business to now we're top 10 consistently. So, so that's the trend we started. And the culture of yes, the way that came about, there were 500, I was reading an article, I hadn't been in the job very long, 2015, probably January, I'm reading an article. It says there's 500,000 companies in Maryland. I thought that's pretty cool. 500,000, there's big guys like Lockheed, Marriott, McCormick, people like that. And then there's a lot of little guys, like a business in Cumberland on Baltimore Street called Wheels Up, with 2.3 employees, trying to make a living by providing bikes and other kinds of things for all the cool uh, outdoor activities that exist in Allegheny County and Garrett County and places like that. And I thought, 500,000 customers. And if you have a customer, like all of you do, what do you say to your customer? They give you business and you say, thank you very much. How can we help you? And if you do a good job, they give you more business. The reason why we kick Virginia's butt 
in those first four years of the Hogan administration, we didn't bring in any big, any big blue. We did not bring a big blue in that was like a one and done, uh, a unicorn, and that gave us great numbers. What we did is we did a lot better job in retention. And for all of you, you see, that's the key to your own business success. You need new business for sure, but don't lose anybody. The customers you have now, don't lose any of them. And if you don't, and you add some new business, guess what? That's what we did in Maryland. You know, in the good old days, whenever Maryland would be competing against Virginia, Virginia would look at, the, look at that and they'd go, pff, pff, that's like having the New York Giants on your schedule. That's another W. That's the way they would look at Maryland. That's another W. And now it ain't a W anymore, because Maryland has, is making a difference. And you all are representing a significant part of what makes us great and what makes us better than, than a lot of the other ones out there. The uh, open for business, you know, we wanted to create a brand. We wanted to create something. We knocked on the doors. I knocked on the doors with the help of a wonderful person named Carolyn O'Keefe. I had 41 businesses within about a few months' time, back in 2015, when I knocked on their door to say, will you invest in Maryland within the marketing message that we're going to create at Commerce? I really need you. I called them all Series A investors. Will you be an investor? And they went, we're in. I said, I don't have a clue what the messaging is going to be yet, but I need your money. 41 businesses gave me five million bucks to help tell the story, Maryland Open for Business. To date, there's been over two and a half million visitors to the Maryland Open for Business website, and we're pushing a billion impressions that business people all over the country have seen in Maryland Open for Business and all the different media placements. And it was because the business community said, I'm in. And we got some money from the gov and the budget, and then the business community stepped in and made a big difference. Let me jump ahead, because there's so many great things happening. I, and it, these are things that a lot of you already know about, but I just want to repeat them again. First of all, I just want to comment on the regions around the state. Another thing, when I came in this job, Maryland is so diversified. In industry sector, we're incredibly diversified from a geography standpoint. I mean, Garrett County doesn't look like Baltimore City. You know, Allegheny doesn't look like Charles County. And in every one of these counties, they have their own strengths. That's a beautiful thing about it. You know, when I realized early on, I, when I came into this and began to learn a lot about Maryland and economic development, I said, you know what? It's a given that Montgomery County needs to show up every day and, and hit it out of the park. They're not, but they need to. Prince George's County, they're a big guy. They got a million people. They need to step up and knock it out of the park. Baltimore County, Anne Arundel County, all the rest of them. But how about the little guys like Dorchester and Caroline and Somerset? I mean, they've got more people that live in one zip code in Prince George's County that live in those three counties combined. But if you're playing at their potential, that's what I always loved. And I always said, we can't be great as a state if everybody is not being successful. So the Carolines and Somerset and the Dorchesters need to get it done just as much as the big guys. And throughout the state, whether you want to go into the western part of the state, where you're going to see an awful lot of things relative to, to tourism, uh, you're starting to see more manufacturing. There was a big win in Washington County recently, Hitachi. Hitachi's going to put 400 jobs there. They're going to build rail cars for WMATA. I went to an event in Washington last night and saw Paul Wiedefeld. He'll be retiring in June, but he's been the head of WMATA for the last seven years. He said, Mike, this is a big deal. He said, they're not only going to build rail cars for Amada, they're going to build rail cars for other customers throughout the United States. So that's a nice win for Washington County, and it blends throughout the rest of that area. And then I talked about, the, talked about uh, Southern Maryland. Southern Maryland's got Nav Air. There's 30,000 people that work in Nav Air. And guess what? Think of all the ecosystem opportunities that exist because of Nav Air. That's the beautiful thing about big ideas, is there's a big idea right there in the middle of the table, but then that whole table comes into play in the ecosystem of that big idea. I don't know what 32,000 jobs at Fort Meade uh, means relative to NSA. My guess it probably means another 125,000 to 150,000 jobs because of it. So that's why big ideas really matter. So, so throughout the state, we've got all kinds of really good news stories. We all know the, the STEAM and the STEM story. It's a, it's a real one. It's a great one. You know what's amazing? 
Todd, sometimes we take our success for granted. We say STEM so casually now. I mean, three or four years ago, we said STEM, we thought it was cool. Now it's kind of like, oh, ho-hum, we know we're great. I mean, we got the best. We have per highest per capita of engineers, scientists, PhDs in the entire United States. We got all that good stuff, but we are good at STEM. And, I'm, and at the, when I get to the end of my remarks, I've got a couple of th messages I want to leave behind with you. Here's a, here's a buzzword I didn't hear in 2015, or an expression, not a buzzword. Computer systems design and services. Now, it, 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 it's, it's one of the sick codes. It, has, it is actually a category. And in Maryland, we can identify today 80,000 plus people who fit into that category. And MTC knows all about that because a lot of those folks are associated with MTC and all the other cool things that go on around our state. So that's a big deal, the, that whole sector. Data centers, to, uh, owe it to a lot of people. We knew, we knew Virginia was, was, was beating us up badly because they were close to Ashburn. They created some incentives 10, 20, 30 years ago when data centers started to become hip and necessary. And now all of a sudden we made changes, property tax abatements and other benefits on, on sales tax, et cetera. And now we're a player. We're a real player in data centers. In 2015, it looked like we'll just have to forget about that sector. We, we just don't, we don't, have a, we don't have an answer. Now we have an answer. A group like Quantum Loophole is doing some incredible things. If they pull off what they intend to pull off, and I've met their senior people, and I gotta tell you what, they are a very focused, committed, talented group. So I have no doubt that they're gonna figure out how to be great and what they're gonna try to, what they're gonna do in Frederick County and other places. You're aware of a lot of the programs, strategic industry grants, the innovative, uh, uh, the innovation uh, uh, program, where our sponsor research at universities, we're able to provide them some capital to keep it going. Morgan State just got their first bite of the apple. By the way, David Wilson's doing a hell of a job, the president at Morgan State. They, are, uh, they have just taken themselves to a whole new level in the last few years. Um, last couple things. Marty hit on one, love it, just love the whole bio hub. It, does, it doesn't solve all of our challenges, but you gotta start somewhere. Life's all about incremental steps. You know, everybody wants to go from A to Z. You know, as, my, as, as, Neil, as Neil and my friend Dabo Sweeney likes to say, hey, there's no shortcuts to success. You gotta take the stairs. You know, but we all wanna get over to the other side real quickly. Um, last couple thoughts. These are really my, I call it my closing remarks. And this is, this is a sobering, this is a sobering comment, but I just want you to follow it away because it's the way life works. It's very fragile. I can rattle off all those Larry Hogan things, and it has been a hell of a story. I have no idea what went on in that, in that administration that preceded the governor. I have no idea. All I know is we are rocking and rolling, and there is so much going on in the state of Maryland. You know, having said that, not everybody wakes up in the morning with a glass of water being half full. I mean, some of us right here in this room today we struggle to get out of our own way and to try to sp spin to something positive because I do believe that a positive attitude, I, I mean, I look at life that simply. A positive attitude can change everything, everything. So I tell you, if you're struggling with something, just flip it. Flip your attitude to all the positives. But here's the point I want to make about fragile. There's a great expression, customer loyalty at best. Customer loyalty at best is fleeting, fragile, and circumstantial. Now, that won't make you get up in the morning and just take a deep breath, because it's basically saying that you might have been great yesterday, but if you're not great today, you might be at risk of losing a customer. That's just the way it works. And on a larger scale, Regardless of all the great success that's happened the last seven plus years in the Hogan administration, it's fragile. Because there's gonna be a whole new group of people that are coming in in November, could be Kelly Schultz, but it will be somebody different. And whatever we've done, it's almost like they're gonna look at it like a blank canvas. Now it's our turn. They may or may not like what we accomplished. So when I mention that to you, I need all of you 
to be aware. I need you to be active. I need you to, to communicate your thoughts. I've said this since day one when I came into the commerce job the first time around. And what I said was, find out who your state senator is, where your business is located, and where you live. Find out who your member of the House of Delegates is, where your business is located, and where you live. And when this session's over in one week, April 11th, and now they have a little bit more time on their hands, these delegates and senators, invite them to come to your company. They like that stuff. Give them a little economic development 101. Tell them about your business. Tell them how you make money. Introduce them to some of your uh, team members. Be real, because they actually do have some interest in knowing what's on your mind. But the success we've had, believe me, it's really fragile. And that's kind of makes you a little anxious. And here's my last thought to leave you with. Heard this one, I don't know, mid-80s I heard it. Wrote it down, put it on a card, giving out the card a lot of times to people. And the expression is, from behind the desk is a dangerous place from which to view the world. From behind the desk is a dangerous place from which to view the world. Be curious. You know, get out there. And by the way, you don't have to physically move away from your desk. I mean, it's a sort of a metaphor in that regard. But just get, be curious. And then I read an interesting article recently that just sort of tied it all together from behind the desk. And here's what it said. It said, if you want to see around corners, you know that great expression, oh, that guy, that guy, he's unbelievable. He can see around corners. Well, it's, it's, it's not really that hard. The way you see around corners is, number one, you listen. You shut up, and you listen. And then after you start to listen a little bit better, you ask questions. And the combination of the two has incredible impact Listen and ask questions. And that's what allows people to see around corners. So again, have a fantastic day, and thank you for what you do and how much you mean to the state of Maryland. Thank you. I, I think, did I leave a couple minutes for a question if anybody has one? Go quick, anybody. I'll answer quick. Any questions? Hey, Chris. That was a pretty good event last night, wasn't it? Man, didn't I look good in that tux? <laughs> so did you. Anything at all? Yes. Huh. Number one question small business owners. <clears throat> Well, big business owners, small business owners, they want, they, they want to ask me about Baltimore. <laughs> I, you know, I wish I could give you, I, I, I just can't come up with something real quickly. I bet you my team here has probably got one. Hey, Lori Ratsberg, what do you think it is? Sure. And by the way, workforce, there's a handful of people, but not many in the room are old enough to remember the Ed Sullivan show. Um, now, some of you say, oh, yeah, yeah, my, grand, my grandmother told me about it. <laughs> but he, his favorite guest was a guy that could spin eight plates at one time. I mean, it, you, <laughs> go YouTube it. He really did. This guy spun eight plates at one time. The good news on workforce, from a programmatic standpoint and from a focus standpoint, that I can't point to an area of the state or an industry sector or one of the government agencies where there isn't some combined effort to, to get, the sh get our shoulder into all things workforce. Everything in the workforce. There's no magic. I mean, forget about the magic wand that was in that bag for the cabinet secretaries. It's more than magic for workforce. But that, that, that's, a, that's a good one, Laurie. And access to capital. That never changes. How about any one last question? Good. Thank you. All right, just to introduce myself, I'm Todd Marks. I'm the chair of the Maryland Technology Council. I'm also the CEO of MindGrub, and I'm going to be our moderator for our first panel. I want to say a couple quick comments um, to transition into that. So a lot of you might not know the history of really the buildup of what brings us here today, but I'll start with a little bit of my history. I grew up in Howard County, 
I went to school in Baltimore City, and my first kind of foray into tech councils was in Baltimore City with the what was the Greater Baltimore Tech Council at the time. Um, I've also joined, I'm on the board of the Northeastern Tech Council. I was part of the Chesapeake Regional Tech Council. I've been a member in the past of the Howard County Tech Council. And through all those kind of experiences, I got to now lead this organization as the chair of the Maryland Tech Council. A lot of you don't realize that about four years ago, we had a Tech Council of Maryland, which was you know, based in Montgomery County, but had reached throughout the state. We had a Chesapeake Regional Tech Council based in Anne Arundel County and had reached throughout the state. And we combined those two organizations. So this was three, four years ago. And like combining any organizations, there was a little bit you know, of culture change there. And what we noticed, though, is that the organization as a whole got bigger and stronger, but we lost a lot of our members in the Annapolis area, in the Anne Arundel County area. And so about two years ago, um, working with Marty and Dave and Bernard and others, we said, we really want to epitomize the Maryland Tech Council, our name. What does that really mean? And it means a couple things. And to bring in what Mike was talking about, it's really looking at our assets, both from a geography perspective and an industry perspective. So what we identified is that a lot of our assets are called that 95 corridor. And so we really wanted to shore up from a tech council perspective that corridor. We had Montgomery County at that point. We were still working with Anne Arundel County. We have partnerships with Howard County. But we recently started the Prince George's County Tech Council, as Marty told you before. And we now have a Baltimore Regional Tech Council. And we are now partnered with, and there will be some more announcements coming out about the Northeastern Maryland Tech Council. So we have now secured that, that 95 corridor, and it's across lots of industries, from bio, life sciences, health tech, cyber, manufacturing technology, education tech, you name it. There's also pockets, as Mike alluded to, in the rest of the state. So if you cross over the Chesapeake in Eastern Shore, there's a lot of hospitality tech with Ocean City, and there's a lot of agri-tech. Two industries that we haven't necessarily focused on, and that's part of our next phase of expansion. If you go south toward Pax River, um, there's a lot of government tech down there, and we're looking to line those, that industry up as well. We have Pax River, we have Fort Meade, we have Aberdeen, huge assets there from a technology perspective. And if you go to the western side of Maryland, you know, from Hagerstown through Cumberland, there's a lot of technology out there. So we're gonna truly become Maryland's tech council. Another thing that Mike had mentioned is that it, it takes everybody, right? And it's been amazing where we got to today because of our board, because of our amazing staff, Wendy, Marty, Michelle, um, I've seen here, I think Pam might be here too. Our amazing staff has, has had that attitude of yes, right, which Mike said as part of Maryland, is that attitude of yes. So we've been able to really grow the last couple of years, and we went from tech councils having sub-million dollar budgets to the last couple of years we've had multi-million dollar budget to now Marty securing an extra $5 million for the Biohub. So now this next year we have a $7 million budget. We've really, really grown. We've added hundreds of new members. So I couldn't be prouder of where we've got this organization the last three years. Now, uh, just to kick off this next panel, um, for me, personally, I want to give a quick story about digital transformation. So about six, seven years ago, MindGrub moved into a new office. Like a lot of businesses, we were on-prem. We had our server closet there. You had to come to the office to get on our network. We weren't VPNing in at the time. And they decided to put two floors above us. And they were core drilling the concrete. And to core drill concrete, you have to flush a lot of water. And it actually remakes concrete, the water and then the dust makes concrete. Well, they core drilled right above our server closet. And if you, if, yeah, she gasped. It was a gasping moment. So we came in on a Monday, and we were really excited to start the work week, internet down. We're like, that's weird. What's going on with the internet? So calling IT, we're like, hey, the internet's down, unlocks the cabinet. We open it up, and the entire server closet is encased in concrete. <laughs> we had, luckily, you know, they had insurance, and they were going to pay for it, but we had no internet. So the office at that point was useless to us. We were out, right? I mean, as much as you want to pair with your phones, it just isn't going to work. So we sent everybody home. We're like, everyone's working from home. And at that point, we realized there's a lot of things that have to happen. We got to make VPN available. And our time card system, which was on-prem, 
people couldn't get to anymore, so we had to figure out how to get it into the cloud. We started to move things into the cloud digitally. HR used to have to walk into the office and do paperwork with HR. But that week, we realized none of that paperwork could happen, so we started to port HR stuff into an intranet. Um, and we also had, we love our swag, my grub swag, right? And that was, we had a warehouse in the office. And we also realized that we need to move our entire, you know, swag system online. We created a marketplace, and now we're even doing remote warehousing and, and drop shipping for employees. But we had that little one week, we had a little taste of digital transformation for a digital business, right? We make mobile apps and websites, but we really got a taste of what it means to transform your business so that you can scale more efficiently using digital tools. So now fast forward to COVID, we are a little over 100 people pre-pandemic, and um, when the pandemic hit, we, we didn't miss a beat, right? We were already using Zoom, we already had everything in the cloud, and we were able to go online virtually from our, from our houses instantly. And we went from about 100, just over 100, to just under 200 in, in 2020 in that first year. And the balance of the, the hires were all over uh, the nation. We now have about as many people around the nation as we do in this greater Baltimore area. And in doing that, we had to then transform again, right? We had to put that many more services online. Now people definitely can't come to the office and we're not putting that genie back in the bottle. But we really missed our office, right? We had a great office, if you've seen it. We have climbing walls and ping pong stations and game rooms and, you know, we love our office. But there's no putting us back in that bottle. We have to be virtual now. Half our team is around the nation. So we thought, how can we recreate some of that great kind of culture that you get, the communications you get from being able to, you know, sit around the water cooler, and apparently millennials don't know what water, Gen Z doesn't know what the water cooler is. They actually don't even understand like the old handheld phones. Uh, they're like, what is that icon? That makes no sense, right? Because phones now are a, a square. Um, so, you know, we had to transform once again, but it got to that point of how can we do things to get back that in, that in office, in person culture. And then lo and behold, Mark Zuckerberg, right, coins the phrase metaverse. And for the first time, now virtual reality, augmented reality, digital tools, socialization, right, all of these concepts come together as the metaverse, right? And, and Facebook changed its name to meta. The metaverse is like, is like we used to say tissue paper, then somebody came across with Kleenex, and now we all say Kleenex, right? Nobody says, can I have a tissue paper anymore, right? Can I get a Kleenex? Metaverse is that for virtual worlds and the combination of the digital and virtual. So MindGrub has made the, uh, the determination we're moving to the metaverse. We're gonna create a new office, we're starting to have meetings, we're starting to build out our office space in the metaverse, but not only is our climbing wall in the metaverse, I mean, a real office, it's like 10 feet tall, it's a bouldering wall. But in the metaverse, it can be thousands of feet tall, right? Um, not only can we have you know, one ping pong station, but we now have, working with a company called Ronde, we have uh, uh, snow fights in our office, right? We can throw snowballs, we can sit around a fire. There's so many things we can do in our metaverse office that we can't do in the, the physical office.